Hello there, I'm Nancy from Black Sheep Knitting. Um, I've been on hiatus for a few weeks um, because I had a shoulder replacement, um, which wasn't due to any accident or anything. It was just when you have osteoarthritis, you get to the point where your joints are bone on bone. So the only thing they can do for you is to completely replace the joint. Um, I would say it's not for the faint of heart, but it does get better on two weeks out and um, the pain is less and less, uh, but it's not fun. And worst of all, I w I've been having trouble knitting and in the beginning I couldn't knit at all. Now I can knit a little bit and it's not terrible. I'm doing a lot of continental knitting, which is, um, which is easier. Watch the video um, from last week. So watch last week's video if you ever end up in this situation. Um, it's much better. But in a couple weeks, the sling will come off. I'll start PT, and I can drive again. Uh, that's one of the worst parts of it is that you're stuck at home because you can't drive. And if you can't net, there's only so much TV or books you can read. And so after a while, um, you start to feel a little bit desperate. Um, I was <laughs> not having fun. Yeah, Robin said she was drinking wine. I didn't even want to drink wine. I had kind of lost my appetite. Um, so I'm on the other side looking forward to um, getting back to normal. So I had all these plans of things I was going to do and projects I was going to take on, um, knitting or otherwise. I didn't do any of them. Um, and I took a lot of naps, which <laughs> was, you know, forced or unforced, um, but always a nap is good for everybody. Anyway, back to knitting. Um, I wanted to revisit um, our how to be a better knitter um, endeavors here. Uh, and one of the things that I would recommend to new and not so new knitters is to use Ravelry. I think I would say, you know, 75% of our knitters know about Ravelry and use it. Um, I would say 50% know how to use it well, and 25% um, know how to use it really well. So um, I find it an invaluable resource. It is a website that you can go to, and it's R A V E L R Y. And all you have to do is give them a um, username and a password and you're in and you can see thousands and thousands and thousands of, of um, patterns and you can learn a lot from Ravelry. You can, one of the first things I do if I'm doing a Ravelry search for a sweater, you know I type in sweater, then there on the left hand side of the screen there's a place for filters and you can put in the size needle you want to use, or the amount of yarn you have, or the gauge that you want to use, or the type of fiber. And then you can click on those things, use those filters. You can also, um, above where it says patterns, because you, you're going to go in and find patterns, there's also a thing that will come up if you put in sweater, then to its right there is a little box that says best match, you, and you click on that, um, I always choose the option that says hot right now, which means that those, that means this is a pattern that people are using. I always also look at how many people have done that project. If you are choosing a pattern um, that no one has done except the designer, don't do it. <coughs> Wait till a few people have done it and get, you can find out um, how it goes. What you will do to find that out, so suppose I usually use above 50 people as kind of my baseline of how many people have, seen, use the, have done the pattern and posted about it. Um, that doesn't mean no one has done it, it just means no one has posted, put up their patterns because on Ravelry people put up their patterns um, their finished objects that they've done and the information about um, the yarn and the needle size and the gauge and everything, how much yarn they used. Um, but that said, if, I, if I've 
seen that say 50 people have done it. I go look at each individual project and I look at the yarn the people use. They'll often say how much they use and they will say don't look at the place where it says comments. That's not what you want to look at. You want to look at the in click on the individual projects to see what people have done. And you can see if there was a problem in the pattern, if they altered the pattern, if they thought the pattern was easy, if they thought the pattern was just a devil and they would never do it again. But all of those things are there to help you and um, provide you with the information that if you're sitting at home, you're not near the yarn shop, the information that you can get from those people. So, um, and you can see the different kinds of yarns. You can see if somebody used a different gauge and what they did. They'll give you lots and lots of information. You can also look up if you have yarn at home and you don't know what to do with it. You can find that yarn on Ravelry. There's a section that says yarns. And gosh, I've almost never found a yarn that wasn't, somebody hadn't posted on Ravelry. So the section um, on yarns, you can click on that and then put in the amount of yarn you have and um, the gauge and so on. And then you can click on that and see what projects people have done. And we do that all the time here in the shop, especially when we're trying to find yarn for samples or find projects for samples. If we've got a yarn, we want to see what people have done with it. So that's also a very useful part of Ravelry. Then Ravelry has a whole other thing of um, forums and groups and um, you can join all those. I tend not to have gotten involved in that simply because I don't have time. Um, but people love them and people who are doing um, knit-alongs and all kinds of things form groups and they're fun and you can make friends. You could, excuse me, also on Ravelry um, you can put in your stash. So you can take photos of your stash and there's a simple way of putting it in there so that you can look up at any time um, yarns that you have and how many yards you have of those and in what colors. You can also indicate that you might want to swap it or sell it or just stash it. So you have those options and people do find sometimes if you're looking for a yarn that um, you can't find in the yarn shop and um, you can put a search out there and see if you can find it and people often do. And a lot of people trade and sell yarn on Ravelry all the time. So it tells you amazing, amazing stuff. So the two geniuses, two women who um, started Ravelry quite a long time ago have um, done an amazing job of keeping it up. And it's the most incredible resource for knitting I've ever seen. It's just it's just amazing. And we always talk about going down the rabbit hole when you go start out in the morning. I get up and that's, I look at my email, then I look at Ravelry and see what's new, what's been posted. And you can save your favorites if you, there's an option to click save and favorites so that you can create your own um, file of favorite patterns. You can, if you buy patterns, and that's the other feature, that's so invaluable about this is that you can buy the patterns online. So you can buy, you get a paper copy, um, and the patterns are generally for sale anywhere from $3 to $12. Um, and you can keep it that in your library, so it will al always be in your library. Um, the other great thing about Ravelry is you can use um, it Knit Minder, what's it called? Knit Companion with it, and um, Knit Companion is another whole thing that I don't really use, but a lot of people do, it where you're, it with interfaces with Ravelry, and so your patterns go on to Knit Companion. You never need a paper copy, and Knit Companion has a whole array of stuff that yeah. um, it does for you. So I um, do think that that is, if you don't use Ravelry already, I would try it out. If you use it just a little bit, I would try to expand my knowledge or my use of, of Ravelry because it will help you a lot. And remember, the one thing you should know um, about Ravelry is there's, there are no, f there's no editing on Ravelry. So a person can put up anything they want. 
That doesn't mean that a pattern, if it's there, it's tried, true, tested, without mistakes. That's not the case at all. Um, that would be a, a going into another realm, another level of what these amazing women do. They couldn't possibly do that kind of thing. Now, when you, um, you know, if you have designers that you know and like, you can pretty much assume that their patterns have been tech edited and tested. But just the random person like you or me, we can write up our pattern and there's an easy way to put it in there. So that doesn't mean it's, you know, the best pattern in the world. So buyer beware. Anyway, the other thing I wanted to talk about um, is using Google. Google can um, be your knitting friend because you can find out how to do just about anything in knitting on Google. There are people who have um, put up videos, tutorials, all kinds of things on Google. So you can, if you want to know how to find out how to do anything just about in knitting, you can Google it and you will find it. So I recommend doing that. The third thing I wanted to talk about today was if you haven't done this, and I've gone over this before, but this is something that remember we talked about having a knitting notebook. Well, in your knitting notebook, you should have your measurements. And by measurements, I mean bust measurement around your bust from you get someone to help you and you hold the tape measure around your back and around the widest part of your bust. And these are going to be your actual measurements. You want the measurement from your top of your shoulder to under your arm. You want the measurement from under your arm to your wrist. You want the measurement, and you can also do it if you like three-quarter length sleeves, you can do that. The other measurement you should do is do a measurement with your arm bent, not straight out. You can do it straight and bent, but you'll notice when you bend your arm, like on a sleeve, the sleeve hikes up a little bit. So you might want to see what that should be. You want to measure your waist right at the middle. And then you want to go down to your hips, the widest part of your hips. Um, you'll want to, what am I forgetting? It's not a bad idea to measure your upper bust. Some people have are wider up here than they are at their actual bust line. So you want to have, and you want to measure around your arm, the circumference of your arm, at the widest part, which is here, and we talked about the length. Um, so those are, oh, and then, this is the one that I tell people all the time. It's the measurement, not from your armpit, because you don't ever want to seam up in your armpit. So go down about two inches from your armpit. Then the measurement, I would do the measurement to your waist, the measurement to your hip, and the measurement to where you like your sweaters to fall. And um, depending on the style, it may be in a different place. Um, but so you'll always want to do that. So never ever do exactly the measurements for either your sleeve or this measurement from under your arm to where the sweater ends. Um, those are based on somebody else's body measurements. So don't assume Never, ever assume that those are your measurements. That's just the measurement that that person did. You can also get a sweater that you like um, in a particular style, and you can measure the sweater. So Robin's showing me the some. The reason is different styles look better in different. So this is wide and cropped. Yep. So this is wide and cropped. So this might look better shorter or longer. And don't forget. Uh, you need to try sweaters on as you're making them. So, um, and here is the distance, the underarm to the bottom. And all of them are going to be different depending on how you want to wear it. Here's one that um, you might want to be slouchy and long. I can't hold it up very well, but um, Robin can probably hold it um, for me. But the measurement of that, the length of that from underarm to the bottom is probably going to be different than a crop top that you want. So those measurements are really, really critical. Another measurement that I didn't mention is your head 
and your hand. So if you are a hat maker, if you like to make hats, you need to get a measurement of your head. And you just put your tape measure around <coughs> where you want um, your head, your um, brim to be, or the edge of your hat, the bottom of your hat. Now, if you're doing a ribbing, you're going to assume that that ribbing has negative ease, which means when you look at it, it's smaller than it's actually going to be when it expands onto your head. So that's an important measurement to have to see how, so have the measurement of your head and then see how once you get going on that ribbing, is it going to stretch out to that measurement and is it going to fit your head? Um, and the nice thing is, is you don't have to knit very much to find that out. You can put, put that on your head pretty easily or you can just lay it out and, and measure it with a tape measure. But that's important and probably the distance from here to the top of your head is a good idea. And then mittens, measure your hand. I mean, you want to make sure that, um, so you want this distance from probably the wrist where the ribbing stops on a mitten and up to your, probably your middle finger. So those are, um, those are really, really important things to have. So you shouldn't have, unless you're, you gained a lot of weight or w lost a lot of weight, you shouldn't have to do this more than once. So I would do it, write it down where you're not going to forget it so you don't have to keep um, keep going back to the drawing board all the time. Um, you can just go grab your knitting notebook. I have my little book that has all my important information and you can just find it and off you go. This week I'm featuring a um, sweater um, in the shop, a new pattern that's come out called Alpine Bloom by Caitlin Hunter. She calls herself by Boylan Knitworks and she's a very experienced wonderful designer um, and this is the um, this is the pattern I'm going to put it over here and Robin will put in a picture um, it's a lovely um, short sleeve fingering weight um, color work I'll show you a few other examples of it because these are some very pretty um, examples uh, it's not a lot of work because it is short-sleeved, although you could um, extend it and make, make it longer. She's using a fingering weight with a gauge ultimately of about six stitches to the inch, so it's a loose fingering. And these kinds of um, fingering weight, if you're using a wool, they're very wearable in the summer, particularly, you know, if you go to work in an office it's perfect because the air conditioning is going to be on and you'll be, um, you know, you won't be hot, you won't be cold. Um, so I chose some um, colorways that I think would be a lot of fun. Uh, for the color work on most of these samples, they've used our favorite um, spin cycle yarns. And I don't think you need a lot. I'm going to say that I think do I have the information? Can you get away with, um, you probably need two skeins of the um, spin cycle dyed in the wool. Oops, right here. So this would be white for the background and black for the, this black and gray and light gray um, for the color work. So that's one choice I have. And you'll see all the colors that I have here would also work with the white. So you could imagine this with um, white. So I've chosen some other yarns. This is the Spin Cycle, the Family Jewel, with Isayer Alpaca, Alpaca 2 Marine Blue. I thought this was, had a nice um, color palette. This is a nice, I like this sort of dull gray-green, but then you'll have this bright pop of the bright greens and yellow and gold. And this one I especially love because I love this color. This is Alpaca 2 Wine. And then how about this for the pop? I think this is so fun. 
So this is dyed in the wool and it's called Pop Click. So I love that. I just think that will be so striking. So much fun. And now mind you, you can wear all of these sweaters all winter long too, um, with either by themselves or with a cardigan. Here's one, this is one of my colors that I just love. This is Farmer's Daughter, um, Foxy Lady. And this one's called Amos Moses. And then we paired it with Robin's Egg in the Spin Cycle. And I really like that one. Sometimes it's nice to have, you know, a different color, but some of the same color in it. So I like that one in particular. And then we came up with this one, which we think is funky and fun. So this is the Isayer 2 Alpaca 2 in copper, which is a very rich, rich copper color. And um, dyed in the wool, cast away. So I love those together, and I think that would be very beautiful. Now you can come up with your own. Um, you could do... Uh, a solid color as your contrast color. You could do all kinds of things, um, play around with it. I think it's a really, um, I'll just show you again her, well, let's see. I have another copy. This one I thought was fun with the white background and the gold or the in it, I thought was really fun. So anyway, it's one pattern that's going to look a lot different depending on what you choose as your yarn. So come in. We have these colors in the shop plus many, many more. And we have many online that you could find. Um, so I think that's it. I'm just adjusting to being back at work after time off. Um, so I'm a little weary wanted to remind you again um, and we will post it in the next week or two um, Bruce Weinstein's workshop um, part of it will be knitting faster how to knit faster which is really fun and he's going to do some other pattern stitches and so now that I'm back at work I'll get back in touch with him and we'll see um, what's going on so um, I hope you have a great week of knitting and happy 4th of July. We will be closed on the 4th and the 5th of July. We're always closed on Monday. So we'll be closed Tuesday the 4th and Wednesday the 5th. So that gives everybody some time off and um, there obviously won't be any class on the 5th, those of you who are in class. And then we'll um, reopen again on Thursday. So we'll see you back then and um, happy, have fun with your family and friends, and we'll see you next time. Bye.